Praise the Lord. Peace and greetings to you all once again in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. My name is Clinton. To those of you who are in Christ Jesus, of course, you know me as Brother Clinton. And this is the Word Prophet Channel, a Christian ministry dedicated to the purpose of teaching the Word of God to the people in the churches of God so that we can go back to serving God in spirit and in truth, as our Lord Jesus Christ commanded. If you speak English, the Holy Bible, King James Version, is the Word of God. And if you have yours in hand, and I hope you do, please turn with me to 2 Timothy in the New Testament. 2 Timothy chapter 3, and in particular verse 12. And I want to share with you something very important. A long time ago, uh, many years ago, I asked God a question, a very important question, to which I know the answer now because he's revealed it to me, but at the time I didn't know, and I want to ask you this question as well. Why is it that famous pastors, famous Christian pastors, are not persecuted for the faith of Jesus Christ? Why is it that men like Billy Graham and John MacArthur and R.C. Sproul and David Jeremiah and Ravi Zacharias and Kenneth Copeland and T.D. Jakes and Creflo Dollar and all the famous Christian pastors that are very rich and famous and well-spoken of, why is it that they're not persecuted? Why is it that when Billy Graham was still alive and on the earth, that when he held his, his rallies and his revivals where there were tens of thousands of people there and he was preaching from the pulpit, why is it that the governors of the state that he was in or the states that he was in, why didn't they send their armies to go and disperse the crowds and arrest Billy Graham and put him in prison? Why is that? If he was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, it seems like he would have been persecuted. Well, when I asked God about that and other men like him, the answer was clear as I searched the scriptures and God revealed to me more and more about what's really going on. What he revealed to me was that Billy Graham never preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to anybody. And that's the truth. Billy Graham was a Jesuit. He worked for the papacy and he knowingly, purposely lied to millions of people for many decades until he died lost, and now he's in the fire of hell forever. You see, because Billy Graham was a Baptist, he was not a Christian. He didn't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He believed in a different God that he called Jesus Christ. That different God that he called Jesus Christ was someone that the Catholics call God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, which person doesn't exist. There's no such person as God the Son. There is no such God called the Son. There is no God called the Son. The only true and living God is the Father, and that's what Jesus Christ our Lord testified when he was praying to God. He said, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God. You see, Jesus said that the God that he prayed to is the only true God. And the Bible says that there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus and that in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now the Godhead is a singular English noun that means God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Godhead. That's what the word Godhead means. It's used three times in the scripture, and in each time it means the same thing. God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Godhead. You see, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, isn't part of the Godhead. The Godhead is in Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says. So Billy Graham didn't know Jesus Christ. He preached a false Jesus and he preached a false gospel for decades. He preached to people the ridiculous lie that if they would accept Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, that God would come into their lives and forgive all their sins and they would be washed by the blood of Jesus. And they all believed it, even though no such thing is written anywhere in the Holy Bible. There's no such thing as God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, and there's no such thing as accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. See, those things aren't mentioned in the Bible anywhere, and people don't know that because they don't read their Bibles. And so I ask God about this. Why, why doesn't Billy Graham get persecuted? Why doesn't Joel Osteen get persecuted? What, what about Kenneth Copeland and T.D. Jakes and Andrew Womack and R.C. Sproul and John MacArthur? And, and all of these famous theologians, all these famous preachers, all these famous so-called pastors, why aren't they persecuted for the faith of Jesus Christ? Why aren't they in prison? 
Why aren't, there being, why aren't they being persecuted? Why don't people hate them? Why don't people throw rocks at them when they preach at their, at their, at their rallies or their, their sermons? Why don't people persecute them? The reason that, that nobody persecutes them is, is because they're not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, they're of the world. And Jesus said to his disciples, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world shall hate you. See, because you're not of the world. Jesus said, even as I am not of the world, you are not of the world either. So if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, then you're not of this world. You don't have to get a bumper sticker and put it on your car that says you're not of this world. If you're not of this world, people will know, and they will hate you. You see, and that's why it's written in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Yea, and all, not some, not most, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You see, if you belong to Jesus Christ and you're established in the truth of his word and you're walking in the truth of his word, you will suffer persecution. That's part of the journey. And that's how you know, partly how you know, that you're on the right path. Mostly how you know you're on the right path is if you read the Word of God and obey it. But when persecution comes, that's a confirmation to you and to me that we are on the right path, that we're over the mark, as they say, that we're doing the right thing. Praise the Lord. So according to the title of this video is the subject that I'm about to get into, and that is, who is it that will persecute you if you're a Christian? And this is, this is why I said in the beginning of this video that it's very important, especially for those of you who are young in the faith, to understand this. When I was young in the faith, about 30 years ago, I, I knew that I was going to get persecuted, even though I had only read through the Bible once or twice at that time, you know, my first year or so in, in being born again. I wasn't even saved yet. I hadn't even obeyed the gospel yet. But I was born again in October of 1994. And I, was, I hit the ground running. I was reading the Bible like crazy. And I was, God was changing my vocabulary. He was changing everything about me. Um, and it took about five years after that, almost five years, until I finally came to the knowledge of the truth of how to obey the gospel of Christ and be saved. And I was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ on June 26th, 1999. And that's when I was saved from my sins. But back in 1994, I was born again. And in 1995, I received the gift of the Holy Ghost. And I was growing in the Lord. And as I was growing in the Lord, I knew when I was young in the Lord that I was going to be persecuted. I knew that. That, that wasn't going to be a surprise for me. It wasn't going to be a shock for me that people were going to persecute me. What came as a shock to me was where that persecution came from. You see, because I thought that the people of this world that didn't care anything about the Bible, that didn't care anything about God, that they were going to be the ones to persecute me. That they were going to be the ones to beat me up or blaspheme God or revile me or call me names or whatever. They were going to run me out of town or whatever. That's what I thought. But I, qu I quickly found out that that was not the case. You see, the sinners of this world that don't read their Bibles, that don't go to church, that don't try to be Christians at all, they don't care what I do. They don't care what you do. They just want to smoke dope and drink beer and fornicate and what you know and whatever. And if we preach the word of God to them, you know they don't like it. But they're not going to waste their time persecuting us for it because they don't care. They don't care. They, there's no fear of God before their eyes either, and they have they have no they have no desire to stop us from preaching the word of God. They just don't want to hear it. See, it just it bothers them, and they don't want to hear it, and they they try to get away from it. But they're not going to persecute us for preaching the word of God. So if that's the case, Brother Clinton, where does persecution come from? Persecution, this is a historical fact that I'm going to tell you. And it's all throughout the Bible as well. Persecution against Christians comes from other people who profess to be Christians. It comes from the ungodly, unregenerate sinners in the churches who do not believe the gospel of Christ, but carry Bibles and go to church and say that they're Christians. It is those people that will persecute you when you're a Christian. It is those people that will become so indignant and so angry against the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ 
that they will hate you, that they will revile you, that they will stomp and snort and blaspheme God. Even many of them will come to the point where they will blaspheme the Holy Ghost right in front of you. They will be filled with the Holy Ghost and refuse to be baptized in His name. And when you preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to them, they will straight up call you a devil. They will straight up call you a servant of the devil. Somebody just did it to me in, in YouTube comments like a half an hour ago. And I never get used to it, but you know, it's 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 a normal occurrence for me now. So it doesn't, you know, it's like water off a duck's back. You know, I used to get really sad about it, but I don't anymore. Because somebody who would blaspheme the Spirit of God is no friend of mine, and I don't feel sorry for them at all. Because their heart is blackened and they hate my God, they hate my Savior. So I don't feel sorry for them at all. I don't weep for them at all, nor should you. See, and this is almost a daily occurrence for me because I have this worldwide ministry. Um, so it's, it might not be a daily occurrence for you if you're a Christian, but it's going to happen. It's going to happen to you, so get ready for that. You know, in one of my favorite chapters of the Bible, 2 Samuel 17, uh, pardon me, it's 1 Samuel 17, when David was sent by his father to go check on the army of Israel. This is the episode, this is the story of Goliath and how David fought with Goliath. And David was sent down, and I have this on my screen right now, so I'm just going to look at uh, Bible Gateway, which I have on my screen right now, and the, and the verse I'm talking about is 1 Samuel 17, 28. But in this chapter, David's father, Jesse, told him to, you know, he gave him some cheeses and some bread and some other things, and he told him to go down to the battle and see how his brethren are faring. And so David did these things, and, and he, uh, he took these things from his father, and he left the sheep with a keeper, and he went down to the battle to check on his brothers and to bring them the things that his father had sent him to give them. And his brother Eliab, who was his older brother, became very indignant. And his brother Eliab said, and it's in 1 Samuel seventeen twenty eight. I have it right in front of me. It says, And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. Now why did Eliab say this? Eliab was one of David's brothers. Remember when Samuel was sent from God to the house of Jesse to anoint the next king of Israel. And Samuel saw Jesse's seven sons. And he said, surely it must be this one. And God said, no, it's not that one. He said, surely it must be this one. God said, no, it's not that one. Until finally, he had seen all of his sons except one. And he said, where's the other one? And Jesse said, he's out in the field, tending to the sheep. And God anointed David. He didn't anoint Eliab, nor, uh, and nor any other of David's brothers. Why? Because these men were goodly to look to, but they were not whom God had chosen because God looks on the heart. So where was Eliab's heart? It wasn't with God. Because why did he accuse his brother David of, of wickedness? David didn't do any wickedness. He obeyed his father. See, and when we obey our father, which is God, then our brethren, supposedly our brethren, those who, who profess to be the children of God, they will falsely accuse us of pride. And naughtiness. But in David there was no pride and naughtiness. Not, at least not in that particular incident. He had obeyed his father. He had just done what his father told him to do. But yet he was accused by his brother. For no reason. For no reason. He was accused of pride and naughtiness. And what of our brother Joseph? Who was one of his father, I, I might say his father's favorite son. And for that reason, and for that reason only, his brethren hated him. They hated him. They couldn't stand him. When they saw him coming, they were like, oh, here's that dreamer of dreams. And they devised a plan. Let's throw him in a pit and leave him there. And they did that. And his brother Judah couldn't handle it, and he saved his life and drew him up out of the pit and sold him to the Midianites instead. So he was sold into slavery. Why? What crime did he commit against his brothers? None. His crime was that he obeyed his father. And so his brothers sold him into slavery. 
And we know the story of Joseph, which is the story of Jesus Christ our Lord, whose brothers sold him to the Romans. And he became exalted second in all the kingdom under his father. Praise the Lord. And so it was that Joseph was exalted second in the kingdom under Pharaoh and was used of God to save the lives of his family, which in turn um, enabled the line of Messiah to come forth. Because if Israel and his family had been killed in the, in the, in the, in the dearth, in the, in the famine, then Messiah wouldn't have come forth. So God used Joseph for that purpose. And this is why Joseph said to his brethren the second time when he revealed himself unto them, You all meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. You see, they persecuted him. They hated him. Why? For one reason. For one reason. Because he obeyed his father. Why did the Jews hate Jesus? For one reason and one reason only. Because he obeyed his father. He was messing up their religious system. They had the control over the people. They had their religious system worked out just the way they liked it. They had their niche with the Romans so that they had their prosperity and the control over the people. They had the Romans on one side and the people of Israel on the other side and they had this cute little niche, this comfortable little niche where they had no problem with the Romans and they had the people of Israel under their control. And then all of a sudden here comes Jesus, the Son of God, speaking the truth of the Word of God and magnifying the law and teaching people the way it really should be, and setting the captives free, and healing the sick, and cleansing the lepers, and raising the dead. And the Jews were furious. Furious. Why? Because he obeyed his Father. You see? So when you're a Christian, and you obey your Father, who is God, the Almighty God, Jesus Christ, when you obey your Father, Jesus Christ, the people in the churches will hate you. They will hate you. If you go into a church building with a title on the door, a, a place where people profess to be Christians, and there's a title on the door, and that church building has a pastor inside who graduated from a seminary, and they have a contract with the beast system called 501c3. They're a denomination. They have that building that God never told them to build, so the man in the pulpit is bound to that building, so he has to lie to the people in order to keep them entertained, to keep the money coming out of their pockets unto him so that he can pay for that building that God never told him to build. So they're in that building and they're compromising the word of God. That's why they're called by a title or a name. That's why it's called a denomination, because they've chosen a lesser name. They've denominated themselves. See, instead of being called the Church of Jesus Christ, instead they're called by another name because they're not in the doctrine of Christ. They're not abiding in the doctrine of Christ, so they don't have God. So they can't be called by his name. So they have to call themselves something else, like Lutheran, or Baptist, or Catholic, or Pentecostal, or Apostolic, or Church of God in Christ, or Assemblies of God, or on and on and on. I could go on and on and on. There's hundreds of them. And they're all of their father the devil. They all have built up a wall between themselves and God because they have chosen, just like Saul, the first king of Israel, chose the will of the people over the word of God. That's why these people have denominated themselves, because they have chosen the will of the people over the word of God. People don't want to hear the whole word of God. Most people, they don't want to hear the whole word of God. They want to hear little bits and pieces, the comfortable parts, but they want to do what they want to do. So they want pastors who graduate from seminaries to tickle their ears and tell them that it's okay for them to be living with another man's wife to be married to another man's wife. She's divorced. Her husband is still alive. This man is married to her. He wants to believe that, got, that God has blessed their marriage. See, even though they're living in open adultery before God and man, because the Bible says that whosoever shall marry her that is put away from her husband doth commit adultery. You see, this is just one example. So Bob married Sharon, who is Tom's wife. Sharon and Tom got divorced. Now Bob is married to Sharon. Tom is still alive. Well, Bob and Sharon are living in adultery. They're living in adultery. It doesn't matter why Sharon is divorced from her husband. She's still his wife. She's bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. So Bob wanted to marry Sharon now because Sharon's divorced and they're both Christians. 
So they said, well, why not get married? And they pretend that God has blessed their marriage. And their pastor, see, they choose a church where their pastor is going to tell them that their marriage is blessed, even though it's cursed because they're living in adultery and adulterers shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So the people want to do what they want to do. So they go shopping around for a church where the man in the pulpit will tell them what they want to hear and then they pay for that entertainment. See, that's called going to church. It's Roman entertainment for sinners. And when you go into one of those church buildings, being a Christian, and you open this book, the Holy Bible, King James Version, you open this book and you begin to tell them what this book says, they will hate you. They will tell you to leave. And if you don't leave, and if you keep preaching the Word of God, they will physically make you leave. They will kick you out. You see, they don't want to hear the Word of God in their churches because they've got their religion all figured out just the way they like it. Just the way they like it. So the people there are comfortable with the religion that the pastor preaches. He uses a little bit of the Word of God and then he twists it around in ways to accommodate the sins of the people. And they like that. It's a little social club. And they pay for that. You see, and they don't like it when Jesus comes into their midst and starts preaching his Father's Word. They don't like that. They will hate you. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Who was it that persecuted the prophets all throughout the Old Testament? Was it the Philistines? Was it the Ammonites? Was it the Girgashites? Nay, it was the people of Israel. They were the ones that stoned their prophets, that persecuted their prophets. They were the ones. Who were the ones that killed the Lord Jesus? The Bible says it was the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus. They turned him over to the Roman authorities to be crucified, and they demanded that he be crucified, even though he had committed no crime. It was the Jews who persecuted Jesus. Who was it that persecuted the apostles? It was the Jews. The Jews. Now, I'm not saying all Jews are evil, because I'm a Jew too. And Paul was a Jew too. And all the apostles were Jews too. Except for Simon the Canaanite. He was a proselyte. But yet, who was it that persecuted the prophets and the Lord Jesus and the apostles and who still persecute Christians today? It is the people that profess to be the people of God. That's what it's always been. And that's what it always will be until the end of all things when God hath put all things under the feet of his Son, Jesus Christ. When he will have put all enemies under the feet of Jesus Christ, as it's written, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And until that is fulfilled completely, it will be the same. The people of this world that don't care anything about the gospel of Jesus Christ, they don't care what you do. They're not going to persecute you. They might laugh at you. They might flip you off, whatever. You know, they might moon you or whatever. But they're not going to persecute you because they don't care what you do. They're just trying to do what they want to do. The ones who are going to persecute you, if you're a Christian, are the ones who profess to be Christians, the ones who go to church and carry Bibles under their arms and imagine that God is a trinity of persons. And they imagine that they're saved from their sins when they have never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, they think that accepting Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior has made them Christians. And they will say, baptism doesn't save you, baptism is a work. Well, wait a second. It isn't accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, isn't that a work? Isn't that something that you do? I think it is. But they think that it's okay to do that, but it's not okay to do this. So they deny the fact that the Bible says that baptism in the name of Jesus Christ is for the remission of sins and that it saves us, that it is the washing of regeneration, that it's how our sins are washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, there are three that bear witness in in earth. The spirit, pardon me, yes, the spirit and the water and the blood. First John 5, 8. There are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree in one. The spirit and the water and the blood. Jesus said, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Why? Because when the New Testament began, his apostles began to preach, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. 
and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You know what that sounds like to me? It sounds like water and spirit. Being baptized in water, calling on the name of the Lord to wash away your sins, and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's water and spirit. And when you have the water and the spirit, then you have the blood. That's what the Bible says. There are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood. What do they bear witness of? Well, in verse 11 in the same chapter, I'm quoting from 1 John chapter 5, and verse 11 says, And this is the record, that God hath given unto us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. You see, that's what these three bear witness of. That's what the three in John, 1 John 5, 7 bear witness of as well. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. It doesn't say the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It says the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Why did John write, and these three are one? Because they are. Those are three terms that refer to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Those are three terms that refer to one person, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see? So there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. See, what is the record? This is the record, that God hath given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. So when you have the Spirit and the water, then you have the blood. If you don't have the Spirit and the water, then you don't have the blood. You can imagine that you do, but you don't. And so these people, these ungodly people in the churches, who are of their father the devil, who have been beguiled, now they're, they're not all of their father the devil. Let me, let me clarify, because many of them are just beguiled, and some of them will come out of there when you preach the Word of God to them. Some of them will believe the word of God when you preach it to them. I did, because I was in that same system, and you have been as well. If you're being honest, you'll have to say that. See? So some of the people, if you, if you preach the word of God to them, will hear it and believe and come out of that religious church system and serve Jesus Christ. You see? But most of them will not, and they are of their father the devil, because they will argue against the word of God. They will call you a heretic. If they had the power to do so, they would burn you at the stake. They would kill you if they had the opportunity to do so. They hate you that much because they're filled with devils and they hate the word of God. They quote parts of it as part of their religious entertainment. But they hate the word of God. They hate the gospel of Jesus Christ. They refuse to hear it. They refuse to obey it. They continue to confess error and heresy and still profess to be Christians. And they are the ones that will persecute you. If you've not seen it already, you will see it if you're my brother or my sister in Christ. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Go in peace.